Greetings and felicitations again. I'd like to dedicate this video to my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. My name is Robert Paul Wieland, and you can call me Rob if you like, because I don't stand on ceremony in that. And I would like to thank you and welcome you again to this video, my second one. In my first one, I tried to point out that the Byzantine readings of the uh, Greek New Testament are as ancient as the Alexandrian readings. That is, that when we take a look at the ancientness of the readings, both the Alexandrian and the Byzantine uh, texts are on the same level. Now, it, the Alexandrian, uh, physically the Alexandrian texts are older, but uh, the Byzantine readings have been shown to be as old as the Alexandrian readings. That was my first video. In this video, I would like to take a look at at least two implications in the first part of this video. And uh, in the second part of the video, I would like to take a look at at least one reason why we should consider the Byzantine manuscripts as superior to the Alexandrian manuscripts rather than the other way around. Today, the Alexandrian manuscripts are considered superior to the Byzantine. So let's take a look at uh, at least two implications concerning this. The first implication regarding the Byzantine manuscripts being the same ancient weight as the Alexandrian manuscripts you can find in your modern translation, such as the NASB, or the ESV, or the NIV, or any of the modern translations, where you're reading in their translations, uh, you'll find a footnote saying uh, the older manuscripts read, or the better manuscripts read. Now, they're engaging in the modern textual view that the older manuscripts are the better manuscripts. And as we have seen, the readings are the same. And therefore, to say that the older manuscripts are better, the readings are better, because they're simply because they're older, which is what they're implying, um, is just not true. And it's a major argument on their part. And this brings us to the second, uh, second implication. And that second implication regards the modern view of textual criticism itself. Now, in the 1700s into the 1800s, um, they were uncovering manuscripts that were older than the Textus Receptus, manuscripts used in the Textus Receptus and the Byzantine manuscripts in general. And these physically older manuscripts were reading differently than the uh, Textus Receptus or the Byzantine manuscripts. And I'm just going to use the Textus Receptus generally. I may even use the word King James Version as well, just to, in a general sense to mean the, uh, mean the Byzantine manuscripts. So they were finding these texts, and then they were coming to the conclusion that these older texts, because they're older, are better. And thus the Textus Receptus needed to be supplanted, taken, uh, taken out, and they needed to create a new uh, Greek text based on these older texts. So they started coming up with a philosophy, and ultimately in 1882, Westcott and Hort uh, came, uh, published this book, the introduction to the New Testament in Greek. And uh, this book that they published uh, encompassed the basic principles of uh, modern textual criticism. And uh, that was fought with by, uh, by many uh, Reformed and Evangelical scholars for a while. Uh, Robert Louis Dabney fought against it. Um, Dean John Bergen uh, fought against it as well, and F.H.A. Scrivener, among others. Um, in the, in the 1900s, it was uh, Hills who fought against it, Letus, and uh, up till today, it's me. <laughs> but uh, that's it, being that as it may. What happened after the printing of this book, B.B. Um, Warfield um, started, uh, went to uh, Germany and studied under the German uh, higher and lower critics there, and uh, was convinced of the uh, theory as well. And uh, he came out with his book on textual criticism. Uh, a lot smaller, but uh, it's more like a popularizer of uh, the Hort Westcott Hort theory. And uh, because of B.B. Warfield's work, uh, it became accepted among Reform scholars. And uh, along with the idea that the older texts are better, um, has now become the predominant uh, understanding of textual criticism today among both Reformed, Evangelical, as well as liberal scholars. So the second implication that the Byzantine readings are as ancient as the Alexandrian readings undermines this view of textual criticism. 
the principles of the genealogical uh, argument, for example, brought up by Westcott and Hort, or the uh, the older manuscripts better, or the uh, the uh, shorter readings are better, um, all are based on this idea that uh, the Alexandrian manuscripts are older and therefore better. But now it's no more. Uh, they can't argue to the point the point that and that the Alexandrian manuscripts are better because they're older. Uh, the playing field has been brought to at least to an even par. And as we look at the Byzantine manuscripts, we're going to find that there are many reasons why we should consider the Byzantine manuscripts as more authoritative than the Alexandrian. And that will bring us into the second part of this video. And uh, so we'll take a look at the second part now. Uh, one reason why the Byzantine manuscripts are uh, superior to the Alexandrian. The uh, first reason that I'm going to give for the superiority of the Byzantine manuscripts uh, can be found in what I would call the geographical argument. Um, Dr. Aland, uh, Barbara and Kurt Aland in their book, The Text of the New Testament, um, makes that distinction uh, based on geographical locations. Um, the Byzantine Antiochian uh, text is generally found in the Byzantine Empire. We'll take a look at that in a, in a minute. Um, the Alexandrian manuscripts are found mostly in Alexandria and Egypt, uh, the Sinai Peninsula. Um, the Vaticanus, which is found in the Vatican Library in Rome, was supposedly brought there from, uh, e from Egypt. Um, so we, what we see is we see general locations where um, these manuscripts are found. Now, they're called the Byzantine manuscripts because most of them are found in what is called the Byzantine Empire. And uh, here is a map of the Byzantine Empire. The green, the dark green area is the original Byzantine Empire, and the light green is the Byzantine Empire at its full expansion. Uh, you'll see that the uh, Byzantine Empire went into Rome, into uh, southern Spain, northern Africa, and even included um, Egypt, Alexandria as well, and uh, the Mideast. Uh, but as uh, Dr. White likes to note, the Muslim expansion uh, condensed this um, area of the Byzantine Empire down to basically what we would call Asia Minor, Turkey, uh, Greece, and, uh, and all of that. So that's the map of the Byzantine Empire. And uh, generally, your Byzantine texts can be found throughout all of this, these areas, um, basically from Antioch all the way up through uh, Asia Minor into Greece, or Rome, Italy. Uh, you'll find Byzantine texts in Ireland, in Scotland, in uh, France, in Germany. Um, you have the translations of the Byzantine manuscripts in Russia, in Armenia. And the Greek Orthodox Church, for example, uh, traces their Greek texts back to the first century. And though we don't have any physical copies of those uh, first century Greek uh, Orthodox, um, their translation is basically well, it's not really a translation, it's the Greek, um, uh, Byzantine in nature. And uh, now we're finding, uh, for example, um, these scholars are saying that you're finding Byzantine manuscripts in Egypt as well. So what we find is we find the Byzantine manuscripts everywhere throughout the known Christendom during the early first centuries of the church. Um, the question is, where are the Alexandrian manuscripts? I mean, we have one in Rome, but that came late there. Um, where else? I mean, if the Alexandrian manuscripts were uh, considered the authoritative manuscripts, then you'd have scriptorums in France and Germany and Italy and Spain uh, copying the, uh, these manuscripts. So uh, what happened to the Alexandrian manuscripts? And Dr. White has an answer for that. He talks about the Muslim expansion and the destruction of um, the scriptorums in Egypt and northern Africa there. And, and, but uh, what he's presupposing is that you can't find the Alexandrian manuscripts throughout the Byzantine Empire, the Roman Empire, or known Christendom at the time. So 
I would like to remind Dr. White of something that he wrote in uh, the uh, in his book, uh, The King James Only Controversy. And uh, here it is. The same is true regarding the protection and preservation of the biblical text. One might well see tremendous divine wisdom in the way God worked over the years. By having the text of the New Testament in particular explode across the known world, ending up in the far-flung corners of the Roman Empire, in relatively short order, God protected the text from the one thing we, centuries and millennia later, could never detect, wholesale change of doctrine or theology by one particular man or group who had full control over the text at any one point in history. So Dr. White, what Greek text exploded across all of known Christendom? It's obviously the Byzantine manuscripts. You'll find them in Alexandria, in Jerusalem, in Antioch, Asia Minor, Greece, uh, Rome. You'll find them in Germany, in France, in Russia, in Armenia. You'll find them in Ireland, in Scotland, in Spain, in Northern Africa. You find the Byzantine manuscripts all over the, 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 uh, the, uh, the known Christian world. But where do you find the Alexandrians? Maybe in Egypt, possibly Caesarea, but that's about it. I mean, the Muslim expansion destroyed all the Alexandrian scriptorums, but, which is what you like to say, but if that's the case, then why weren't the scriptorums in France or Germany or Greece or anywhere else which were producing what they believed were the uh, originals, uh, the original language copies, why weren't they producing Alexandrian copies? That's, uh, this, I believe, this first part of the geographical argument is uh, devastating to the text-critical uh, view. Uh, the second part is, uh, consider, for example, the first century. Where is Paul writing? Paul's writing to Corinth. He's writing to Rome. He's writing to Galatia. He's writing to Ephesus. He's writing to all the churches that we would later call the Byzantine Empire, where the Byzantine manuscripts are being found. Peter, Asia Minor. Uh, John, Asia Minor, uh, all, the, uh, all the autographs you're going to find in the churches that were later going to be called the Byzantine Empire in Asia Minor, in Greece, in Rome, uh, in Israel area, uh, the originals. So what churches, for example, um, which actually possessed the originals, which aren't they the ones who would know what the originals look like? And aren't they the ones who are going to be copying the originals? And these copies are the Byzantine manuscripts. Um, in Alexandria, there's no letter of Paul to Alexandria. No letter of Peter to Alexandria or John. The Alexandrian scribes, if they got copy, when they got copies, you should say, were probably second generation, but probably not even that good. I mean, considering time and that stuff, it was probably more like 10th generation that they received their copies. So that's the two points in the geographical argument. The Byzantine manuscripts are the ones that exploded across all of Christendom, and the uh, Byzantine manuscripts are the ones that uh, that were located where the originals would be found. So most probably they're the copies. So anyway, my time is up. I thank you again for watching this video. I hope it's been helpful, and I look forward to being criticized both on the internet and on videos. And. Uh, Hopefully we'll have a good, lively, and godly discussion. Until then, I pray God's richest blessings upon you. And this video is for Christ, and Christ alone. Amen.